welcome everybody. My name is Laura Sutherland and I am co-chair of the PRC's Climate Communication Group. Um, I chaired the group with Rebecca Zeitlin and today I am thrilled to have um, one of our events which is the second in our series of exploring how climate change affects different sectors and today we're collaborating with the fabulous PRC Health Group and um, I, I want to thank uh, actually ASTAR for really helping to, to suggest people to pull this together with me and for collaborating and also to Anitra as well for um, expertly coordinating um, the content um, and the guests and making sure that everything came together as well um, and for going to she's going to be hosting so um, looking forward to that also um, just wanted to give you a little bit of context as to um, today I, I suppose um, obviously we know that climate change is um, high on the agenda and um, it's even more uh, you know further up the agenda and on um, board agendas especially um, with reporting with legislation changes um, but we sometimes forget how actually climate change can affect people and impact people and on lives and you know through our jobs as PR and communication professionals we ultimately have um, a real responsibility and an opportunity to be able to uh, positively work together collaboratively to be able to make a difference to people's lives um, through proper communication and through building relationships, through understanding and um, learning and knowledge. And um, that's partly why we've collaborated with the health group because I'm not a health expert. Um, and it's great that we can come together and start to, to look at the sort of intersectionality of, of um, these conversations and major issues that we face in the world. Um, if you want to, if you're tweeting from this event today or um, checking things out later on, you can use the hashtag climate comms. Um, that's something we've been using in the past. And also, um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but our group launched a new website, um, which is climatecomsgroup.com, um, where we add our events onto it. We do guest blog posts. We summarize some of the events that we've been involved with. And we also have a sign up list if you want to sign up and be part of the community and part of the conversation and hopefully part of the solution. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Anitra just now, um, who's going to introduce you to our fabulous panel, and I'm really looking forward to participating in the event. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And hello, welcome everybody. I'm Anitra. I'm a director at Edelman, and I work in uh, climate and in healthcare. And I'm joined today by our two experts. Um, first, Dr. Elaine Mulcahy, who I think I hope I said that right. Um, who is director at the UK uh, Health Alliance on Climate Change, which is an organiza 38 organizations um, that are built with healthcare professionals that advocate for action on climate and also help to uh, empower healthcare professionals in taking action in this space. And then also by Laura Mann, who is at AstraZeneca, a biopharmaceutical company. And Laura is the head of uh, sustainability corporate affairs and global partnerships as well as the uh, Secretariat Lead for the uh, Sustainable Markets Initiative Health Systems Task. Uh, so thank you both for joining us. And I think we'll, we'll dive right into the discussion. And I might ask you, Elaine, to provide us with a bit of background. Uh, so in maybe a minute or two, could you summarize for anyone that's not an expert in the audience why climate change actually has an impact on people's health? Sure, thank you, and thanks for the opportunity to be here as well. Um, yeah, so um, really interested in what Laura said just in her introduction there about um, being a climate climate communications person and not knowing not not being a health expert because one of the things we're trying to do is connect health and climate a bit better in terms of our knowledge and understanding. Um, and there has been a huge gap, I think, in a lot of the communication around the impacts of climate change on health. Um, so just thought I'd pick out three key things um, to, to get thinking about the impacts of climate change and health. So the first one, we talk a lot about global warming. Heat is the obvious first one to mention. Um, and we saw last year the direct impacts of that in the UK 
um, where we had those heat waves and, and the heat waves have been felt all over the world for years and years, but they're definitely getting more and more severe with climate change. But to put in perspective, from a UK perspective, um, last year, between the 1st of June and the 31st of August, there were 3,300 excess deaths reported during the heat waves um, during that period. That's 82,000 deaths a day. Um, and when we think what happened during the COVID pandemic and we were getting the daily kind of reports on the number of deaths from COVID, if you put that in comparison, you know, we're not getting the same level of communication when it comes to the impacts of climate change on, on health and, and lives. Another one to mention is extreme weather events. So in the 80s, so I was born in 1976, so when I was about 10 years old in, um, in the 1980s, we were looking at about 300 extreme weather events globally a year. So that's everything from floods, tropical storms, heat waves, displacement of people, and, and everything that comes with those things in terms of the impacts on health and well-being. So I say in the 80s, 300 annually a year. Right now, it's up about 1,000 a year. My daughter is 11 years old. So she is now living in a world where there's a 1,000 of these extreme weather events a year. And as well as the direct impact on health um, in terms of physical impacts with trauma um, and injury and things like that, there's also a huge mental health toll that comes with, with those experiences. And then finally, I'll mention air pollution. Um, so there was a report out just this week from Imperial College London on the impacts of air pollution on health and then that it impacts the human body at all stages. We think about air pollution as something that affects our lungs and breathing. Actually, it's much broader than that. There was a report from Scotland last year, came out of Aberdeen, that found carbon particles to soot essentially in the lungs and brains of unborn babies. Um, and so what start in life is that for them from, the, from their health perspective? Already in the UK, we're seeing about 38,000 deaths a year linked to air pollution. So it's got huge consequences um, that, that we haven't had in the mindset um, up until now. But they're just three examples I thought I would um, provide. Great, thank you. And... And Laura, from, from your perspective, you work for a, a medicines manufacturer. Why is this relevant to you? And maybe you could also touch a little bit on the flip side to what Elaine was speaking about. What, what's the impact of the health sector on the climate? Thanks so much, um, uh, Anitra. And Elaine, definitely resonate with the points that you've made around the climate crisis as a public health crisis. And, and just to add another stat for our um, uh, audience, heat-related deaths due to extreme temperatures are, are expected to treble by 2050. Um, so it's the air pollution for sure and that impact on lung health as well as kind of other health um, uh, impacts, but um, there's the temperature, extreme temperature impacts too. Um, I think as a, as a, as a pharmaceutical um, company, um, we recognize the climate crisis and the impact on health, on public health. At the same time, we also recognise that the climate crisis is a health equity issue. Those countries that are um, most um, impacted actually are those which are often the least emitting, um, so the low middle income countries. But at the same time, vulnerable populations around the world, whether we're talking um, high income countries or low middle income countries are also impacted too. So there's an economic case for change as well as a health equity case for change there. I think at the same time, we at AstraZeneca and many of our peers in the healthcare space are also very cognizant of the uh, healthcare impact on climate. So about 5% of global greenhouse gas emissions actually come from the healthcare sector, from the R&D, the manufacture, the delivery um, of medicines and healthcare to patients, and that's both the public and private sectors combined. And actually in, in developed economies such as the US, um, that statistic goes up to about 8%. So 8% of, of, of emissions in the US come from health, um, delivery of health care. Um, just last week, actually, um, our chief executive, um, Pascal Sorio, uh, wrote an op-ed in The Guardian and highlighted um, you know, his, his view that the climate crisis is the biggest health crisis of, of, it, of our time, even bigger 
than COVID-19. And I think, you know, everyone's been touched by COVID. Um, we played a very active role in the pandemic, but I think quantifying that the climate crisis in this way is hopefully going to also um, kind of make people kind of sit up and think a little bit more, as Elaine said, about the health climate being health crisis um, uh, uh, being uh, health challenges rather being impacted so much by climate. So I think we're, we're, we're very um, conscious of and are keen to take action on both sides of the coin there. Great, thanks. And it's a, a good segue. You mentioned uh, the op-ed from, from Pascal and the Guardian. Elaine, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit now about how communications plays a role in achieving the vision of your organization. Maybe you could also you include an example of a, a campaign or a project you've recently worked on so people can really see that come to life. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so the youth health, as you mentioned at the start, so we've got 38 members, organizational members of the youth health alliance, and it's growing a lot actually. Um, and we've certainly in the last couple of years has been a huge influx of members. We've grown by well over 50% in the last two years. So there's that um awareness among health professionals of that the importance of taking action and advocacy and communicating climate change has definitely become more in the psyche and of these organizations and more of a priority, which is a good thing. Um, the work that we do is really, there are three strands to it. One is around raising awareness. So that's about improving knowledge and understanding um, of the links between health and climate change. Second is around empowering people, particularly empowering health professionals to advocate for better responses to the climate crisis. And the third one is about influencing change um, and influencing decision makers and policy makers um, to take actions and make policies that protect health from climate change. All of these things require communication and good communication. We need to be able to articulate the message um, and make sure it's well understood to get it out there. Um, and we really strongly believe that health professionals have a very important role to play in that. Um, just going back to what you know, Laura mentioned, the COVID pandemic, I've mentioned it already as well, because there, there are a lot of similarities to draw from that, but a, a, a lot of really significant differences as well. And one of those is communication around it. So the pandemic, so in 2020, I'm throwing more stats out, but, but I think they're important. In 2020, 3 million people died around the world from COVID-19. They were, they were the excess deaths, 3 million people. That same year, 8 million people died from air pollution. Um, and so with COVID, it was drastic action that we took. We were all locked in our houses. The message came from health professionals. I live in Scotland. I live in Glasgow. Um, and I know from my perspective, it was the chief medical officer, it was the national clinical director. It was the presidents of the Royal Colleges. These were the people who were on the radio and the television every day talking about what was happening and why it was so important that we all took action to protect ourselves. We haven't seen the same level of importance of protecting ourselves and protecting health when it comes to what we're doing with climate change and pollution and those sorts of things. So there's a really important role there for health to be framing the message around climate change. And also health, health professionals are trusted voices when you ask, there's been multiple surveys about who are the most trusted profession and nurses and doctors almost always come out and talk, particularly nurses. So getting more health professionals, care workers involved in, in communicating that message and sharing their stories and experiences, I think is really important. And that's some of the work that we're trying to do. And I can, do you want me to give you an example of yeah, this campaign? Will I do that? Sorry, I don't want to talking too much, taking over the dog all day. Um, so an example of the campaign we did last year, which um, was really, really successful. We we actually, because COP27 was on in Egypt in Sharm el Sheikh, um, and again, Laura's mentioned the, the, the terrible climate in, the injustice of the climate crisis. And it is those in the most vulnerable countries who are suffering consequences the most. And it is those in the wealthier countries who've created the bulk of the problem. Um, so with um, COP27 taking place in Sharm el-Sheikh last year, we coordinated with 16 
editors of African medical journals um, and editorial. So it was the first time these editors from across those 13 countries across the continent of Africa came together to write an editorial on why what was happening in Africa matters to everybody and the need for urgent action to you know on climate justice at COP27, particularly around the loss and damage fund. Um, we got them together, we produced this editorial, we then went out globally to multiple um, health journals and 260 health journals around the world published that editorial on the same day. And that included the big journals, um, JAMA, the New England Journal of Medicine, the Indian Medical Journal, the British Medical Journal, the Lancet, um, all of these journals, 216 total published this editorial to get that message out there. So that was reaching the health community in terms of the readership, but also because it was such an unprecedented event in terms of these authors coming together and all of these journals publishing it, the story was also published in 130 news and was covered in 130 news pieces um, in multiple countries around the world, reaching estimated 8 million people. And on social media, there was also an estimated reach for 3 million people. So a huge response and a huge um, impact in terms of reaching people and getting that message out there. So that's an example of a campaign that we've done that was really successful. And um, we hope in getting that message across. Thank you. Um, and then Laura, would you say that you're speaking to similar people, healthcare professionals, general public, what kind of a role does communications play in the work of AstraZeneca on, on climate and health? Thank you. I think, um, yeah, communications is absolutely pivotal. And I think, you know, again, concur with Elaine, this, this uh, very deep interconnection between population and planetary health and societal health actually is not perhaps um, understood. It's not out there in the public kind of domain as, as it needs to be, because ultimately everyone can play a role um, in protecting their own health and the health of, of those around them and, and more broadly. Um, so yes, I think communication is, is critical. I think um, from a corporate perspective, speaking kind of, um, you know, on behalf of AstraZeneca in terms of communicating our vision for sustainability, what we're doing, the actions that we're taking, we have a very, very bold sustainability and climate um, strategy, as well as kind of a broader um, uh, ambition and commitments around kind of population health and health system strengthening, which is um, very much connected. Um, but we also need to um, uh, transparently and accurately report on our progress, um, on the opportunities, on the risks, because of the regulatory environment. And as a premium listed company, we are required to do so. Um, but we also kind of speak to and engage with our, a number of stakeholder groups in addition to what we need to do. Um, so we speak, of course, and engage with our employees. Um, you know, we have a bold ambition to be net zero uh, by uh, 2045 in line with the Science Based Targets Initiative. And it's really um, in the hands of all of our 80,000 plus employees to help make the change to get there. We have short tar term targets as well, uh, of course. We also work with governments and policymakers around the world to advance the delivery of sustainable health care to support improved patient outcomes while reducing the um, emissions, the environmental footprint of care. Um, and then in addition to AstraZeneca, um, as you mentioned, Anitra, I'm, I'm, in, I'm involved with the Sustainable Markets Initiative or the SMI Health Systems Task Force. Um, this is a group that was originally convened by um, uh, His Majesty King Charles in his, his former role as Prince of Wales. Uh, and the SMI is a coalition of the willing at the global CEO level who have come together to try and um, uh, support a more sustainable um, uh, economy and more sustainable markets where um, you can drive growth in harmony with, with people and planet. And here we're working together in this health systems task force with six other global pharmaceutical company um, chief executives and, and world leaders in health, um, including the Director General of the WHO. So we're coming together uh, to see what, in addition to our, our own individual organisational targets and ambitions, can we do by holding hands collectively? How can we raise the bar and drive um, the transition towards net zero health systems 
And here communications is really important too. There's a great program of work. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's white papers that we've published on, on the website, on the, the SMI website, but it's also around campaigning, around the urgency to do this, what we're doing, why, and also to, um, to Elaine's point to kind of inspire um, others to take action too, because I think this is an area of, of where there's you know, relatively limited competitive advantage, and actually it's an area where we can work together with our peers um, across borders as well to try and you know, drive a more sustainable future. So um, communications is certainly important there. Thanks. Um, and so you, you have both mentioned now, I think that public awareness of the connection between health and climate might not be where it should be. And we're not seeing the, the level of discourse in the news online that, that we'd hope. So Elaine, maybe I could ask you about your thoughts on how we can more effectively engage people in this. And I think most people feel when they see the news that it's quite stark and, and the reality is stark. So how do we kind of find that balance between motivating and engaging people while also being honest about the challenges that we face? Yeah, thank you. It's, it's a tricky one. And there's there are many, many different levels to it as well, I think. So for example, um, I know during the heat wave last year, there were, you know, there were TV shows, morning shows on television who were celebrating and pictures of beaches and bikinis and people having a great time, which we do need to keep enjoying ourselves. But the other side of it is that, you know, there were, there were people dying every day and there were people suffering because of that heat um, and that side of it, was not being reported um, and so and that's the stark sad side of it but it is the reality as well and it maybe doesn't help people so much who who are you know, celebrating this and oh the sun is shining let's go out in it and um, because they're not aware of the impact that could be having on their health and so we there needs to be a bit of balance in the communication um, However, the stark side of it, I think, I think what's important in messaging is being honest with people that, you know, this is where we're at, but also there is a really hopeful, positive message there. Um, and the reports that have come out from the IPCC, yes, they're stark, they are really strong warnings, um, but they're also ones of hope. Um, the solutions are there. It's all with in our grasp, we can achieve these things if we work together and if we if we do them, we know what we need to do. I mean, that that's it's not like we're we're fighting a big unknown here. The solutions are there and we know what we need to do. It's how quickly and how willing we are to do them. Um, that's really important. And the trajectory that we're on just now is not a very good one. Um, but we can turn it around. But people need to understand why. It needs to be turned around, so they need to be equipped with the knowledge um, to want to, to change and then with the means to do that. So there are some that, that's where government action then becomes really, really important. So, for example, we can tell people you know, there, there's a real positive message there about, um, say, reducing the use of cars. So transport has a huge impact on pollution levels um, and and. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so we need to reduce the number of cars on our roads and encourage cycling and walking, which is good as well as reducing pollution and the damaging health impacts that causes. Cycling and walking are good for your health. They, they come with additional health benefits, so they're good for us. However, we do need the infrastructure to be there to enable us to do this. So I could tell my daughter to cycle to school but the road I live on is not safe for her to cycle to school. My, my daughter can't even cycle a bike because there's nowhere where I live for her to safely learn to cycle. Um, it's, it's, so she's never actually got to the point and she's 13 years old. Um, so we need the infrastructure there in place to enable people to do the things that are good for them. So there's, there's two levels, of it. there's individual action that we can encourage and promote, but people can get very disheartened if the infrastructure then, you know, they're able to actually do it. They want to do these things, but they can't because 
yeah. systems aren't there and that's where government comes in so I think there, there are loads of different levels of communication but ultimately hope and positivity I think is what what will get people through um eventually but honesty is important too mm -hmm. okay so there quite quite a bit there educating people you know making them aware allowing them to feel empowered but doing it mindful of the context that they're in um yeah and then maybe laura as a private sector actor i think there are different um considerations when you think of tone i think you know you want to have hope you want to have positive engagement but the private sector in particular needs to be careful around uh, greenwashing or, or or overstating claims or activities. Um, so how do you how do you find that balance and communicate responsibly while still, you know, encouraging and empowering people to kind of join join you? Yeah, it's a great question. Thanks, um, thanks, Anitra. I think you know. As most people know, uh, uh, I think we we rose to fame during the pandemic at AstraZeneca, and we're a science-driven company. And and you know our, our motto is we follow the science, and that's how we um, aim to um, craft our communications as well. Our, our communications need to be backed up by scientific rigor, and we are applying the same level of rigor um, and accuracy to our communications on sustainability as we do when we talk about you know, oncology or asthma or some of the other areas that we're very focused on as, as a business. So I think that the rigor, the science um, is, is really important. Um, we, you know, also leverage data um, and we're a company that kind of very much believes in um, walking walking the talk and demonstrating what we're doing through actions. Um, so our ambition zero carbon strategy is a great example. This is our decarbonisation pathway, and as I think I mentioned earlier on, we have a goal to be net zero, kind of science-based net zero by 2045, and we have other kind of mid-term, short and mid-term targets along the way. So that's one way in which we try and kind of um, explain very clearly to our stakeholders, whether investors, employees, potential employees, um, uh, healthcare professionals, kind of how we are um, going about that. Um, I think at the same time, it's really important to have a human um, touch um, and a human voice um, it, when communicating this topic. It's one that you know I remember being at COP um, uh, in Egypt and hearing um, a, a senior leader of the WHO, Dr. Maria Nera, who looks after their climate and health team and is a, a physician by training, saying, you know, you know, we've we've heard we've seen the polar bears and, and the ice melting, and that's incredibly sad. But we need to also recognise that you know, that climate change is hurting our lungs. And that kind of kind of very positive, very powerful kind of human connection, I think can make people sit up and kind of realize the impact um, of climate change on health. And of course, we, we know it goes above and beyond lungs. Um, but I think some of these clear statements and calls to action and the paint picture we need to paint about what the harm is, but also what the positive opportunity is for net zero healthcare delivery um, is is really important to convey through through effective comms. Um, I think the greenwashing risk is clear. It's something we're very cognizant of, um, and um, you know we have kind of clear processes and guidance in place at, at AstraZeneca to try and make sure we don't um, you know fall into kind of traps. I think it's interesting that sustainability is a topic that people are so passionate about. Um, and want to talk about, um, and I think it's finding that right balance um, between empowering people to talk about something they are so passionate about and proud of, um, but also doing it in the right way um, and in an accurate um, uh, way. Uh, so, you know, we're not accused of, um, of uh, doing things that, you know, that we're not doing. So it's, it's, it's a really fine line, but it's fabulous to see that Sustainability is a real source of pride for our employees, and it's actually a driver of people coming to join us as a company and many other um, organisations that have strong sustainability credentials too. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm just going to now invite um, anyone who would like to start dropping questions into the Q&A, please feel free to do so. We'll, we'll continue the discussion, but if I, if I see things come up, I'll keep an eye on it um, and try to ask ask the questions as soon as I can. So um, please do submit your questions in the chat. Uh, so now I kind of want to move to um, 
kind of getting getting engaged in this agenda. I, I'm not sure where our audience comes from. I assume some people are working in health and climate or maybe just health or maybe just climate. So how do we start to bring together these two worlds more? So maybe I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Elaine, and ask if someone is sitting on one side, the, the climate side or, or the, the health side, how would you recommend that they form that bridge and, and start to talk to, to both subjects or communicate on, on both areas? Thanks. Well, so the the first kind of place I would, I would think um, is the health sector itself. So Laura mentioned that the health sector contributes a huge amount of greenhouse gas emissions. It is um, a huge emitter of the carbon footprint. Um, and so within health sectors all over the world, um, the every, you know, they're all trying to, to address their emissions. And there's lots of opportunities. They've all got plans, they've all got strategies in place. And so there's lots of opportunities there for coming together to see what's going on and to see where, where individuals from climate sector might be able to, to work within the health sector and get, get to know that. There's also a lot of resources and organizations who are out there making these connections. We've got um, a group that meets monthly, um, which we call the Health Organizations Coordination Group. <laughs> um, but it, it's it's an open invitation and it's it's individuals from organizations who are working in the area of climate and health together and sustainability. So for example, the Center for Sustainable Healthcare, um, Med Act, Healthcare Without Harm. There are loads of organizations out there who are all working within this space. And the reason we come together monthly is to share what we're doing to make sure there's not a lot of duplication of work. And because one of one of the issues about where we are just now is that everyone's becoming motivated and mobilized in this, well, not everybody, but loads of people are becoming mobilized in this space. There are lots of new organizations and groups and networks setting up all of the time. And so one of the risks we have is spreading ourselves too thinly when actually there are already existing groups out there. So I would say, look and see what's out there already. And um, we've got links to lots of resources and, and organizations on our website who we work with um, and, and see what's out there already that, that you can get involved. And I think depending on where you're at and what your interests are, you'll find something there for you that you can, you can get involved with. Can I ask the same question of you, Laura? How, how would you recommend people get into this space if they're sitting more firmly in one of the two camps? Yeah, I think um, I think you're right, Elaine. There are a lot of different groups talking about this and Healthcare Without Harm was one that I've, I was going to also reference. It's the group that's been going for a long time. I think um, I think often and um, what I've heard from speaking to, you know, um, colleagues from across different companies and organizations is that people are aware that it's an issue, but they're not quite sure how to act. Um, and so through the, the SMI Health Systems Task Force, what we've tried to look to do through some white papers, for example, that we published last year is to kind of explain what the challenges are, but give some very, very concrete examples of what you can do to reduce. Because I think there's a will, but there's a, there's a I think there's, there's not always a sense that Kind of you know what is the way to do it i think there's also perhaps a misconception in many ways that it's expensive um uh, uh and while you know sometimes the initial upfront costs may be there actually we've certainly found at astrazeneca and from speaking with other you know peer companies that this actually makes good business sense because if you drive down if you drive um up efficiencies if you use less less power energy if you waste less, then actually overall your costs go down. So actually it makes good business sense um, in terms of running an organization to work more sustainably, to use less natural resources, and it's good for, 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 for the planet too. Um, so that's um, that's something that we're, we have been trying to kind of um, spread the word on, but also, as I mentioned, give some very clear and concrete um, tips on what to do both in terms of decarbonizing the healthcare supply chain, in terms of decarbonizing right across the patient care pathway, um, and also how you can leverage digital innovation, um, for example, in clinical trials, um, and doing so both 
you know, cuts down the emissions because people aren't driving to and from the clinic to do the clinical trials, but it also actually enables a broader group of patients to have access to clinical trials. So there's an, an equity and an improved patient experience there too. So those are just some of the examples that we've explored through the SMI in terms of kind of educating and sharing concrete examples and best practices from across the sector. But also, um, in addition to that, we have very clear commitments and actions that we've held ourselves accountable to through our CEOs kind of holding hands, as it were, and making very bold commitments on what we are going to do. Um, and we're committed to updating transparently what the progress is on those actions. And hopefully that can then in, in turn in, inspire others. But I think, I think the actions and the steps towards taking those actions are, are really important to, to, to make people you know, understand that it is doable, you know, um, it's feasible and, and it can be done. And maybe, Laura, if you want to just continue, uh, somewhat, someone's asked the question on, are we getting this right in your opinion? So maybe you could build on that with, what do you think is the most difficult thing now about communications in this space? And telling that story you were just speaking to about it actually being a, an efficient way to run a business and all, all the opportunities that come from it. So what are the opportunities to tell this story better? What are the challenges? Yeah, I mean, I think I think there are some challenges around, you know, with increased regulations from Europe, from the US, you know, um, from the UK, um, and, and I'm sure that this is only going to grow. I think there's probably a nervousness around how to communicate in the right way. I think there's perhaps um, a nervousness also about in some jurisdictions about kind of legal action um, or, or kind of you know action if um, statements are made, if things are disclosed, and uh, you know, and if they don't hold up to scrutiny. I think there's a bit of a nervousness around that. Um, which I think is understandable. I think there are more eyes on this topic than there have ever been before, you know, from investors, from governments, um, from regulators. Um, so I think that accuracy is really important. And I think this really calls for a kind of collective and cross-functional approach within whichever organization you're sat in, um, you know, across key um, disciplines like finance, legal, communications, sustainability, kind of technical leads to make sure that you know, how you are communicating is um, held up to kind of the right level of rigor um, um, and that there are checks and balances in place to make sure that that, that, that um, progress is, is being accurately reported. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's very, very helpful and encouraging that there are, you know, very well-regarded organizations, whether it's the CDP or the SBTI, that have, um, you know, leading standards and guidance in, in place to support organizations to disclose and update in a transparent way. So I think, you know, one shouldn't be discouraged by the fact that there is more rigor. Rigor is good, and it means that people are being held to account in the right way um, and, and with the right high standards. And I think it's on, you know, it's on, you know, organizations to kind of step up um, uh, 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 and meet those standards. But I do think fora such as this, where there can be a dialogue around how do you do that, are so important. And, and more importantly um, than ever, will be kind of um, cross border um, engagements and, and dialogues, such as the, the group that the WHO leads called the ATTACH, the Alliance for, for, for a Transformative Action on Climate and Health which brings together ministries of health and other key governmental players on how can we do this. Um, that's a great forum um, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to kind of share best practices and, as well as technical knowledge and, um, and learnings. Um, and one where the SMI task force is kind of um, playing the private, is, is, is sharing kind of best practices from the private sector. Um, but it's not, it's not straightforward, uh, it's not easy. Um, I don't think it's, there's a challenge here, but it's an important one that we must rise to. Yeah, and Elaine, from the perspective of your organization, are, is it similar challenges? I, I assume it would be quite, quite a different uh, context that you're operating in, maybe different challenges and different opportunities. Yeah, so uh, the, the big, when it comes to um, communication in the health, sector what we found and there's been there's been quite a few studies about this is knowledge is is the biggest barrier and i think there was a question in the chat actually as well about equipping health professionals um there is 
there's a lot of evidence that um, people and, and including that particularly health professionals who want to do something, but don't, don't have the knowledge, they don't feel confident they have the knowledge um, or the skills or the tools to enable them to take the action or to communicate on the issues um, on, on what steps people could take. So there's a huge barrier there. Um, and you know, there, there are many, many reasons for that. Um, so there are some practical actions being taken to address that. Um, so for example, in the in the UK and actually in quite a lot of countries, um, certainly in the US and in Canada, I believe, um, sustainability in healthcare has now been embedded into the undergraduate medical curriculum, for example. Um, but we're still at the stage where we're trying to get universities to take up that part of the curriculum. You know, so it's, it's, it was approved by the GMC last year um, and it's now part of the reading list for undergraduate medical curriculum in the UK, but only as of last year. So there are a lot of people graduating from medical school who've never had learning about the links um, from a health perspective of climate change. And thankfully that is changing now, but it's been very slow to get to that point. So there, there is, you know, about a million health professionals working um, in the NHS who haven't had that training and experience. So um, there are lots of courses and now there's webinars and stuff out there, but it's, an, it's, because, it's been an add-on to what they're currently doing. So we need more education. We need the tools to equip people, the knowledge. Um, we have been doing some work with the GMC and with a lot of other organizations and partners to get um, sustainability embedded into the good medical practice, which is the, it's the, the, annual review of um, doctors basically working in the UK to, to make sure they're delivering the competency they need within the role. But sustainability is not really in that just now. So we're getting that and we're, we're trying um, to get that within it. So it becomes part of the job rather than an add-on, which is really, really important. Um, because health professionals are so stretched in what they do, they do what they need to do and and even though they might want to do work in other areas they want, want to do work in sustainability if it's not going to count towards their annual review it's, it's more difficult when you're time limited so it's good if it can contribute we're also um there's a consultation also open just now at the healthcare professionals council which is for allied health professionals and they're also looking at embedding sustainability within their guidance for allied health professionals so there's those levels of work that, that are going on in the background. Um, but then separately, it's the it's the communication bit. It's when there's an event like a heat wave or a flooding at a hospital ground or um, air pollution, you know, high air pollution levels, that health professionals are part of the discussion and on that in the public sphere. And so some of the work that we're looking at doing as well is training up some health care professionals to be spokespeople. Um, so when the media or journalists are looking for somebody to talk about these things, it's not always an environmentalist, it's also a health care professional who's, who's able to speak on these things. But we're, there's a big gap there just now um, that we hope we can we can start to fill with some of the work we're doing. Um, but it's a, a really underfunded area. Um, you know, we're doing this with a tiny amount of funding. We're training up about 15 people, but it's been really difficult to get funding for this sort of thing, but it's so critically important. And so there's still a bit of work with funders to, to recognize the value of and the importance of this for, for action. So I think we've still a long way to go actually. Um, but we're certainly making steps and the motivation and the drive is certainly there within the sector to do it. And um, we've got a question in the chat around prominent trends in sustainability communication. So is there something, uh, Laura, that you're seeing occur, you know, either amongst your, your peers or in the broader healthcare or environmental sector that you weren't seeing? Uh, couple of years ago and um, the person has also asked about behavioral change so do you try within your communications to also have an action-oriented activity to drive change from the general public or whichever audience you're trying to reach 
Yeah, good, very good questions. Um, I think in terms of the trends, a couple of things um, uh, stand out. I think scope three uh, is a topic that, that stands out. Um, and these are really the emissions that sit with that, with outside of an organization's direct um, kind of um, uh, control. So for AstraZeneca, our supplier base, right through the organizations that supply our test tubes um, uh, to our, um, our customers um, and how ultimately how patients use our medicines there are our scope three. Um, so they sit out of our direct operations, our manufacturing sites, our um, car fleets, et cetera, which would class as scope one and two. Um, and for many large healthcare companies like AstraZeneca, scope three emissions are really big and often the kind of lion's share of our emissions. So um, I think, you know, how we work with partners, with our suppliers to, to encourage them to reduce um, their emissions is really, really critical. Um, you know, we probably, you know, have more, um, uh, it's probably easier for us to reduce um, our scope one and two because they're directly within our control, but how we engage with a large, and very vast number of and a diverse number of suppliers on this topic is a, is a really key um, theme for us and many other organizations, both within and outside of the pharmaceutical sector. Um, I think another theme which is growing in importance and visibility um, is um, biodiversity restoration. Um, so I think a couple of years ago, it was perhaps more of a discussion from a communications perspective about carbon. Um, I think there's a recognition now that it's not just about carbon. There are other types of greenhouse gas emissions too, but also in addition to that, it's not just about um, um, reducing um, our um, emissions, which is of course critically important, but also how we ensure that we are um, respecting um, and um, investing in the, the world's natural resources. Um, uh, um, in, in including, you know, how we um, uh, can support the, the restoration of land, whether that's forestry, et cetera. And again, this is another quite um, polemical issue in terms of how some actors are behaving um, and different types of practices. And I think, you know, it's, it's on, I think, therefore companies to really, again, be very clear and transparent in the communications of what they're doing and why. Um, the, um, the, 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 there is a growing um, uh, um, uh, kind of um, attention on kind of um, natural um, uh, resources, whereas before with carbon, with the TF, TCFD, for example, reporting that's been going for a while now, and now we have the TNFD coming up um, uh, around nature uh, related uh, financial disclosure, disclosures. But I do think this biodiversity um, natural resources theme, also things like water, how we how we how we um, you know uh, treat water, our, our approaches to waste, circularity are becoming um, increasingly um, uh, uh, important and called for by different stakeholder groups. Um, and then I think just very briefly to the, the question around um, um, the kind of call to action and behaviour change. I think yes, absolutely. And people. Um, ultimately want to know kind of what you know what does this mean for me what do I need to do so I think you know broadly that we are seeing a huge interest in um, the topic of sustainability it's, a, it, it, it's something that people feel very passionate about where they feel that they they can make a difference above and beyond their day job but people want to know how how can I act what can I do in my day um, uh, day what can I do in my span of control to make a positive difference so absolutely the internal engagement um, employee engagement and, and, and working with employees as advocates for this topic is a huge opportunity, I think, and a positive agenda as well. Yeah. And um, Elaine, in, in your world, I know you spoke about some trends in terms of the knowledge gap is maybe slowly being closed by some, some initiatives, but are there any other trends that stand out to you in climate and health communications? things to look out for, watch out for, for anyone that's working in this space. So I'll, I'm going to echo what Laura said about biodiversity loss. Um, it has been something that's been missing from the conversation and the communications, but it's a massive issue. It's it's unfortunately another big, massive concern that that's 
that's been there alongside climate change, but actually is happening as well as climate change. And it's got a huge impact on health as well. So biodiversity loss impacts water quality, increases the risk of infectious diseases, um, other non-communicable diseases, um, food insecurity, um, the development of medicines in the future could be impacted by diversity loss. Um, and it's potentially going to cause mass migration of people as well. And biodiversity loss is not just a climate change issue. Climate change is the second biggest cause of biodiversity loss. The biggest cause of biodiversity loss is the human food system. Mm. So the way that we produce and um, process food um, has a huge impact on nature and biodiversity. Um, so it's, it looks like climate change will overtake um, food system in terms of the impact on, on nature. But actually right now it, it's a food system um, about the land, 75% of land and 66% or something of marine environments have been impacted by the human food system. And it, it's a potential another serious consequence for health so that's unfortunately another distressing um trend that's happening but again there are actions there, there are you know there's really clear protocols and actions and targets that have been set years ago um we're not achieving them but again we know what we need to do um if we if we just need to do them and, and it's within our gift it's within our power to do these things um and then just just um, going on to the behavior change um, piece as well, and it, it is I, I really strongly believe it's about human stories and empowering people, um, you know, putting a human face on this is you know get, getting into people's emotions and triggering something that's relatable, um, and it's not a distant threat. It's it's something that. That's emo that you know it's emotional, um, and that human impact of of what's happening, I think, is is what really drives people to make change and organisations to make change, and then along with that, empowering them to do that with. So so what do I do about it? Well, here's here's what you can do. Here's what organisations can do. If you work for a company, are they doing these things? If not, why not? Go and ask them. Um, but it's knowing what questions to ask and, and feeling empowered, I think, is I think that helps people in dealing with the, the kind of catastrophic kind of overwhelming aspect of all of this. Um, so knowledge and information is key. Um, so we're, we're coming close to the end. I, I want to ask two more questions. One would just be if you each reflect on some top top tips or, or questions to ask yourself if you're working on any communication strategy, campaign, uh, material, just to go through and say, have I done this? Have I done that? Um, for, for all of the comms professionals on the line. Before that, I just very quickly wanted to ask you, Laura, a conversation, um, a question from the conversation, uh, which is how does ESG fit into it? And I know that's not a one, <laughs> a one minute answer, but I know it is a, a source of confusion for a lot of people or people are unsure what's sustainability, what's ESG. So maybe just perspective of, of working at AstraZeneca, could you give a headline on how, how those two things differ or how they work together? Thanks, um, uh, Anitra. And I, yeah, there, there is certainly a trend at the moment for saying ESG and sustainability are, 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 are different things. And, and, you know, I think they probably are. I think ultimately they're very much interconnected. So for us at AstraZeneca, we have quite a broad and holistic approach to sustainability, which encompasses environmental protection, access to healthcare and ethics and transparency. So our, our understanding of um, um, uh, uh, sustainability is quite broad and that informs our strategy. Um, so here we're, we're talking about tackling um, to, or taking climate action, about supporting health systems resilience and strengthening, um, as well as, um, um, as as health equity. I think with ESG, I think primarily 
um, people have have taken that to kind of be more the the investor lens um, and the government's le governance lens, and of course it stands for um, um, environmental, um, uh, social, and, and governance. Um, we um, you know we, we work very cross functionally um, on sustainability and ESG uh, at AstraZeneca. I don't think we differentiate between them per se, we talk about sustainability as a whole, but of course we get ESG questions and topics that come up. Um, uh, but actually we, you know, when it comes to governance, for example, we have a, a sustainability board committee that looks at this, but also we have uh, sustainability as a core theme for our senior executive team, you know, led by our chief executive, Pascal. So, um, and then our board as a whole takes a, a very keen interest in sustainability. So we have that specialist board committee, our, our board approach and our set, what we call our senior executive team approach. And then we have various governance groups within the organization that look at um, sustainability. So it really is embedded across how we are thinking about um, our company, our company um, ambition, our company strategy, our company values. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I, I don't know if I have the perfect answer between what's the difference between sustainability and ESG. I think sustainability is probably broader, um, but um, perhaps it's, 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 it's somewhat semantics there. I think it's more important is kind of what's the approach um, uh, that you're taking as an organisation and is it really embedded through the organisation and people for ownership and accountability to deliver on the specific targets um, to, 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 to achieve um, you know, positive outcomes for the long term. Thanks. Okay, so Elena, I'll hand over to you for 20, 30 seconds for your top tips and then Laura giving you a second to think of yours. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I'm going for it. So first of all, um, honesty and evidence based, you know, fact based information is really important. Secondly, I think a human, a human element to it, a human story is, is so powerful and makes such a difference. Um, thirdly, then, uh, some hope and positivity and like we talked about those you know, so what do I do you know some examples for people of practical steps you can take I think they'd be the four key things I would um, put in my top tips great you do you have any Laura you didn't get yeah I'm going to say they're quite similar to to um to Elaine's I think do, do they do they hold up to are they credible are they are they back, backed by science and data do they, do they stand up to to kind of pressure testing. I think you're right, Elaine, there needs to be a human angle. There needs to be a, a, a driver to make people want to take action. Um, and there needs to be a relevance um, from a local um, perspective. It needs to feel relevant to where you are and what you're doing and um, uh, as, as well. So I think, you know, particularly working for a, a multinational company, we, need, we, we, we try and think about what's the kind of, what's the global message, but what are then the, what's the application at, at a regional and local level too. All right, thank you. Well, thank you both so much. I certainly found this to be very interesting and helpful and I hope, I hope everyone on the line did as well. We didn't manage to get to everybody's questions, but I think we covered them um, for the most part. And um, I don't wanna speak out of turn for Laura and Ishtar and the PRCA, but hopefully we see more of these sessions taking place as, as a, um, something that continues to be important and I think of even more importance um, down the line. So thank you very much to our panelists and attendees. And thank you to you, Jen, as well. <laughs> Thanks very much for the invite. It was really a great discussion and um, uh, Elaine, Laura, um, very nice to meet you. Thanks everyone. You too, thank you so much. Thanks. Bye everyone. Thank you.